This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash free books for a free downloadable copy in PDF form of this book. Productive Christians in an Age of Guilt Manipulators, A Biblical Response to Ronald J. Sider by David Chilton, published by Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas, copyright 1981. I am reading the revised and expanded edition dedicated to P.T. Bauer, forward by Gary North. Chapter 15, Preparing the Church for Slavery. The kind of tension, feelings of guilt you mention is inherent in the message. Ronald Sider, The Wittenberg Door, October 1979, page 15. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Exodus 20, verse 16. The policies of state intervention do not attain their professed goals. They cannot do so, for they are in violation of God's commands, and this is his world. Foreign aid does not help the poor. Price controls create an imbalanced, chaotic market. Minimum wage laws result in unemployment. Profit restrictions increase consumer cost. Enforced economic equality means a radical political inequality. In short, all attempts by the state to abolish poverty serve only to intensify it in one way or another. We have also seen, however, that statism has another often unprofessed goal, domination over men. This urge for power is the only thing that statism can satisfy, and that lasts only so long as God withholds his judgment. The demand for statism is a demand for control, nothing more or less. The real goal of increasing government intervention is totalitarianism. What does what part does Ronald Sider play in the establishment of a totalitarian state? While he does call repeatedly for statism, That is not the main thrust of the books published under his name. There are many in our day who would try to convince us that we need a bigger big brother. But Sider's function in the revolution is much more specialized. Whether he is a calculating propagandist or merely an ignorant tool in the hands of others, the evidence points strongly toward the former. He nonetheless is serving the cause of totalitarianism in a way in which, for example, Marx and Keynes were unable to do so. This is because of two factors, his sphere of activity and his message. Ronald Sider's semi-official standing as a theologian gives him unique access to positions of influence denied to other statists. He claims to be a Christian, and his writings are dotted with Bible quotations. He teaches at a school which trains men for the ministry. He is invited to speak at Christian churches, colleges, seminaries, and conferences. His books are distributed by an important Christian publishing house, and I have not yet seen one Christian bookstore that does not carry his books. One store near me refuses to stock any books that uphold biblical law, while Cider's books advocating theft are prominently displayed. His articles are printed in the leading Christian magazines. Clearly, he has a powerful platform from which to speak. His message is being heard and is increasingly accepted. In speaking to a Christian school teacher whom I, have, whom I had just met, I happened to use the word biblical. She immediately assumed, for no other reason, that I was talking about cider and the evangelicals for social action. Sider's specific message is one of guilt. In a previous chapter, we noted some of the many ways he attempts to cause us to be ashamed, embarrassed, and humiliated because of the blessings we enjoy under the hand of God. Envy is directed at us from all sides by his skillful manipulation of fallacies, distortion of facts, and misinterpretation of Scripture. Envy is then inverted and becomes guilt not in the biblical sense of actual moral transgression of God's law, but psychological, sociological guilt, the feeling of being responsible for the envy of others. 
and perhaps no to tool of totalitarianism is as significant as the ability to induce guilt feelings. How is this so? It is because of the relationship of guilt and the loss of freedom. If a man is enslaved to guilt, he is rendered powerless. The child who feels guilty for not completing his homework is unable to face his classmates and teacher with confidence. The businessman who feels guilty for having made some error is unable to fu fully direct his concentration to the task at hand. When we are ashamed, guilty, for failing to remember someone's birthday or anniversary, we are less able to deal with him personally. I have known several college students whose sense of guilt because of one or two instances of tardiness was so great that they would begin cutting classes to avoid facing the professor. Eventually, they would drop the course altogether. Guilt is an extremely powerful force. When we feel it, we become distracted, confused, and incompetent. We fail to recognize our valid responsibilities and are much more likely to be manipulated by others. We become overly dependent upon others to make decisions for us and begin to avoid necessary confrontations and independent actions. We become slaves. Our external social slavery is produced by our slavery of heart and mind. One of the most striking examples of the power of guilt, an incident that changed the course of history, is in the life of King Harold of England during the Norman invasion in 1066. Harold was an inspiring leader, a man unusually able to inflame others with intense loyalty and obedience. During his brief reign, he faced two major crises, and they occurred less than three weeks apart. The first was the Battle of Stamford Bridge, in which Harold successfully repulsed the attempted takeover of England by the King of Norway. The second crisis was the Battle of Hastings, which he lost to the Normans, led by William the Bastard, later known as William the Conqueror, which shows what happened when winners write the history books. One important reason for the difference in outcome between the two battles was King Harold's state of mind, which underwent a drastic change just before the conflict with William. While preparing for the battle, he received word that the Pope had excommunicated him and had given his blessing to William. It turned out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Harold acted as, as if the life he had as if the life had been sucked out of him. When he went into battle against William, he was unable to lead his men. David Howarth writes that in marked contrast to the encounter at Stamford Bridge, the English army never moved. It never acted as if it had received a general order. It stood where it was all day, only shrinking in on itself as its numbers fell. It never, never made a concerted attack, nor in the end did it make a concerted retreat. Either Harold never gave a general order, or else it was never carried out. The strangely passive battle he fought seems to fit a mood of fatalism, as if he scarcely fought for victory, but simply awaited the expression of God's judgment. His behavior at Stamford Bridge and Hastings was utterly different. Both battles were equally long and equally hard fought, between armies almost equally matched, but in the first, he was always in attack. In the second, never. In the first and in the whole episode of York, he undoubtedly inspired everyone, but in the second, he left no evidence of leadership at all. He acted like a different man. Something had changed in changed him in the 18 days between. He was behind the line and most of the men in front, one can only suppose, stood facing death all day without a word of encouragement or command from the king they were fighting for. Guilt produces passivity and makes a man programmed for defeat. The importance for this, for totalitarianism, cannot be overemphasized. If a whole society can be made to feel guilty, 
It will be unable to withstand an enslaving state. It is ripe for conquest. This has long been recognized as the most successful method of rendering men passive and pliable, incapable of resistance to statist domination and control. A major aspect of the communist takeover of China was the manipulation of envy and guilt by the organization of community discussions around leading questions such as who has supported whom and who has made whom rich and the encouragement of the aggrieved to spit out their bitterness. The communist exploitation of grievances was probably more systematic than anything in the past. This is precisely what Cider is doing. He piles on the guilt fast and thick. We are guilty for eating meat, sugar, fish, bananas, for drinking wine and coffee, for making profits, for having extra clothing in the closet for having green lawns, even for living in North America. He approves of the heretical legalistic position that anyone who lives on more than the bare necessities of life will go to hell. <coughs> he encourages groups to examine and evaluate each other's expenditures in terms of their envious standards. The practical results of such tactics can be observed in any issue of the other side as writers regularly flog themselves for their failure to be totally committed to the ideal of economic and population stagnation, confessing their occasional cravings for steaks and other wicked goodies. As guilt produces impotence, it also leads people to call for more and more controls from the state. The passive population is not only malleable, Yielding, submissive, it, is positive, it positively welcomes state intervention. Sider's cleverness in this is diabolical. <clears throat> First he tells us that a billion people are starving because of our eating habits. Hmm. Next he urges his guilt-absorbed breeders to reduce their quotas of beef. But this is not enough, because unless one also changes public policy, the primary effect of reducing one's meat consumption may simply be to enable the Russians to buy more grain at a cheaper price next year, or to persuade farmers to plant less wheat. And just think how much more guilty we would be then. And so the pliant masses who read Cider, having been primed by a dozen years of statist indoctrination in the public schools, are manipulated by this alternation of envy, guilt, and hopelessness into asking for stricter controls, broader legislation, increasing intrusions, more bondage. The guilty, unable to solve life's problems, will be saved by the state. And Sider's goal of establishing an oppressive regime is working. Christians have become obsessed with their own imagined wrongdoings, while entirely ignoring the real violations of God's law, agonizing over their criminal inability to feed the hunger. The hungry, <coughs> glutted with remorse and shame because of their secret love for ice cream, suffering nagging worries about just how much their vacations contribute to world poverty, wondering how many children die on their account, longing for the day when the government will be empowered to decide all these questions, taking the growing burden off of their shoulders. The churches also have become enslaved. Regardless of all the hoopla over the new Christian right, many pastors are towing the government line. When was the last time your minister spoke out against unbacked paper money and the expansion of credit? Does he even want to know what those words mean? A well-known pastor in Southern California holds strong personal beliefs against homosexuality, abortion, the Equal Rights Amendment, and other modern examples of our national apostasy. <coughs> you would never know that from his sermons. Know that from his sermons because... He never utters a peep about them. He's worried about the tax exemption from his heavily mortgaged shiny new temple. He doesn't want it taken away, so he keeps quiet. Essentially, he is an agent of the state, 
terrified about the consequences of resisting tyranny. Men overcome by fear and guilt are unable to fight. The more the church is enslaved, the harder it will be to resist the state's tyrannical invasions. The more we become preoccupied with these fantasy world sins, (coughs) these transgressions of which the Bible says not a word, the less able we will be to obey God's command to exercise dominion over the earth. Under the vain delusion of false guilt, the church will retreat leaving already conquered territory for the devil's illegitimate sway. His emissaries seek to distract God's people from their true mission of world conquest and full development of the earth's resources by sending us off into vacuous campaigns against illusory windmills. Sadly, many in the church, with a cultivated ignorance of Scripture, are heeding the lies of their enemies. (coughs) The captivity of the church is essential to the strategy of the statist. If the church can be persuaded to abandon its real calling, nothing on earth can prevent the domination of power-mad government. The people of God have been freed from their slavery to sin, thus ultimately from slavery to all but God, and are not easily dominated by men. There is no inherent slavery in the believer as there is in the unbeliever. Moreover, the people of God have been raised up with Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 6. He, as our representative, is seated on the throne of all power, above the principalities and powers, as supreme Lord over all who have rule and authority. Ephesians 1, 20 to 22. Jesus is the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Revelation nineteen sixteen. And we rule with him, waging war and overcoming. No state, none, can successfully lord it over God's people. (coughs) We are kings, and those who oppose us must be crushed to powder. The nation that will not serve us will perish. Isaiah 60, verse 12. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth, He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. Psalm 47, 2-3 It is thus of crucial importance to Satan's plan that he delude the church into thinking she is powerless. (coughs) And if the church is bemused by guilt manipulators and sapped of her vigor, our nation is lost. Christians alone have the power of dominion over the evil one. We alone can provide the moral force to prevail against the enslaving state, for the principle of liberty in Christ has set us free from the bondage of men. We alone can preserve our land from destruction, for we are the salt of the earth. But if the day comes that we lose our savor, we will be cast out with the heathen. We would like to tell ourselves that this can never happen to God's people, but that is a devilish lie to keep us secure in the very mouth of destruction. It happened to the churches of France in 1789, of all Europe in 1848, of Russia in 1917, of Germany in 1933. In every case... The churches had been rendered impotent by guilt, by fear, by benefits, and always because the church departed from the word of God as the only standard for every area of life. Do not say it cannot happen here. That is to say that we can do all things without Christ. Do not say that we will somehow muddle through the crisis of the hour. Christ did not call us to muddling but to victory. Life is a battle, no more. It is a war to the death with the forces of evil. We cannot merely hold our ground. If we do not conquer, we will be conquered. If we do not gather with the victorious Christ, we are scattering abroad. There is no middle ground, no possible moderation or compromise. If Ronald Sider and his ideological colleagues have their way, 
my children could be slaves to a ruthless bureaucracy before they reach maturity. Your children will join them. This is no ivory tower issue. It is not an airy, inconsequential debate between abstract theologies. Sider states himself somewhat vaguely with respect to the specific political programs he prefers, the means employed to enforce them, and the limits of state power. He is vague about just how much personal wealth constitutes immoral wealth. But he is clear enough, we need more compulsory wealth redistribution. We have too much wealth. Vague standards of righteousness coupled with emotional generalities can produce a lot of guilt. That, of course, is the whole point. Nor is this a political or economic contest alone, as if we may leave the job to the professionals. Dominion is the task of every man and woman in the kingdom of God. God holds you and me responsible for the future of, your, of our children. You must do the work. If you abandon your calling, you are bringing down God's judgment on your seed. There is no escape. And never, never assume that you will be raptured out of the earth before the trouble begins. That is the retreatist dream, and it blinds us to the truth. It is presumption. Why should God do for you what he did not do for others? <coughs> Were Christians raptured from the Inquisition? Were the 10,000 men, women, and babies who were slain in their beds on St. Bartholomew's Day in Paris raptured out? Are Christians who suffered tribulation from statists around the world being raptured daily? Consider Jesus' prayer to his Father. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. John seventeen fifteen. Our Lord did not pray for us to be raptured away from the problems of life before God's confrontation with Satan in his world, in this world, is over. He prayed that we would not be overcome by the devil. And it is to be feared that those who think only of escape have already been overcome. There is no escape except death. We must choose between victory or defeat, conquest or flight, dominion or slavery, in time and on earth. Ronald Sider's mission is to hobble the church from fulfilling her divine calling, for he is enough of a theologian to understand that history follows the church. If God's people are impotent, the world is enslaved to sin. When they are free, the world finds liberty in Christ. The key to status control is to keep blinders on the church so that she knows neither her calling nor the puny weakness of her foes. Victory belongs to the people of God. If we re retreat, God will smash us and raise us up, raise up another generation that will follow him in his conquest of the nations. Our commission will succeed. The nations will be discipled to the obedience of the faith. If we do not do it, others will. But if we do not do it, we will be thrown away and trodden under the feet of men, men who will make us their slaves. If we are obedient, we, ha we need have no fear. We rule with Christ. We have the almighty power of the Lord God at our disposal. And he will move heaven and earth for his obedient people. He calls us not into battle alone. He calls us to go with him through the battle into victory. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. 
And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.